is Cliff Click. We're here at Coffee Compiler Club to talk about compilers and language runtimes and typing systems and type theory and I don't know, not the nil and whether or not lazy evaluation is a good thing or not. Um, we have a special guest, Simon Peyton Jones, who says he doesn't have a set agenda, but he's willing to take questions. I know a bunch of people had some questions including something about type classes and I don't know what came on this morning. There was a bunch. <laughs> yes. Well, Hello. Nice to meet you all. Mm -hmm. So does anybody want to start with a question or am I going to lead? Or well, I, think to everyone, I think everyone knows who Simon is. So maybe it would be worth having everyone do a 15 second introduction the other way. Since That's fine. Okay. I'll great. start yeah. and then uh, I'll call names to keep an order out according to the order of my monitor random zoom order but do keep it short because there's there's 15 people here yeah so i'm cliff click i did the uh the c2 compiler and the core core guts of the java virtual machine amongst many other random things startups and and uh and currently doing uh compiler language research and so shaw you're next hi i'm shaw suma i do research into really fast interpreters and questionable just-in-time compilers. I wrote mini VM and uh, that's then a web assembly runtime. Yeah. Cool, uh, Alan. Okay, um, so my name's Alan. Um, no major accomplishments yet, but I'm writing the Strascut programming language, which is, it's coming along. You know, everyone's like, when are you going to implement it? And I, the answer is I'm still designing it, so yeah. Cool. Chris Engelbert. Right. Yeah, I'm Chris. Um, I'm even worse than Alan. I never actually wrote a compiler, but I'm really interested into <laughs> all things compilers and I love breaking the JVM, where at least I, that is what I did in the past most of the time. Cameron. Uh, working on ecstasy. Programming language. <laughs> Not the pills. Or, Not or the pills. No. no pills for me. No mushrooms either. Ah. Simon, the other Simon. I'm largely working on all the things you probably don't need in programming languages and annoying people with it that they should leave it out. And currently writing a Risk V backend for my language. And what is your what is your URL in case Simon wants to check it out? The other Simon. Oh, uh, put them I'll, in the Google Docs. I post it in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, put it. Yes, it's actually a really good read. So worth 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 a uh, an hour on the weekend. All right, Jamie. Uh, yeah, I'm Jamie, former now PhD student um, working on bus combinators in Haskell, and now I uh, both help teach introductory Haskell lectures at Imperial and also teach compilers in the second year. Great, Adrian. I'm uh, Adrian Alich. I love doing things from first principles. I like operating systems. I like compilers. I love memory unsafe programming and <laughs> memory unsafe languages. And yeah, I like doing cursed stuff. Dahlia. Um, so I am a soon to be prospective PhD student working on a compiler right now using CF nodes and egress for the mid end. Um, I've long been interested in Haskell, so hopefully I can ask about uh, your mid-end stuff with the STG, so. Mm -hmm. uh, Derek. Hey, I'm Derek. I'm working on an AI accelerator uh, hardware for my startup, and I'm building a compiler that uh, targets its sort of weird uh, SIMD architecture uh, with Python syntax and using C of nodes in the backend. Mm -hmm. Aaron. Hi, I'm Aaron. I work on databases, specifically distributed database context where you don't necessarily fully trust the other parties. So you have to keep attestations for where every piece of data came from in case you want to pull everything out that came from an untrusted publisher in the future. Mostly my interest is in ways to get runtimes to give you some idea what's actually happening, because I find that Software is a surprisingly black box, considering it's like the only thing you can measure without probe effect. Uh, Nathaniel. Hey, I'm a student in Imperial, uh, just interested in programming languages, basically. 
Good to you. And yes. Hey, I'm Anand. I'm interested in compilers and program analysis, and these days I am enjoying Haskell. Wow, your your sound was hard to pick up there. I heard Haskell though. Okay, good. <laughs> I got uh, a special signal process for that. No, nice. Okay, so uh, Mooney or Inrat Mooney. Not Mike, not working. An Imperial, another Imperial student. Okay, so I think these were invited by Jamie, which is fine. I just didn't know where they came from. But I, I actually did not do that. You did not <laughs> do that. <laughs> I haven't changed my Zoom link in a long time, kind of on purpose, but maybe it's better this way. Matt. Hi, I'm Matt. I work on compiler optimizations uh, for supercomputers in LLVM. And I'm interested in anything from computer architecture to programming languages theory. Mm -hmm. Matt is our resident librarian. If oh, he's there's good. any paper that you ever need, Matt will know the link based on like three word description. It's freaking amazing. amazing. Actually, yeah. Uh, I admit Arthur. I like papers. <laughs> Arthur. Hi, uh, I'm Arthur. I'm working at Azul and uh, working on a just in time compiler for Java based on LLVM uh, known as Falcon. Levo. Oh, Levo sometimes has audio problems and that and connection problems, both, which he's not yeah. Hey. So I write a lot of low level code and uh, a compiler. So okay. and I like optimization, I guess. So uh, you know, there there's the the round trip tour is a bunch of compiler gearheads. Great. Um do you want to so, say something or we'll just go into questions? Oh, we could just we could just um, toss in. I'm, I mean, I, you probably know that I work on Haskell, but I'm also quite involved in computing education, um, in particularly in the UK, and trying to figure out what we should teach our children about computer science um, at school. Um, and I work for Epic Games now, which is a big change for me. Over the in the, uh, I've been at Epic about two years now, working on a programming language called Verse. Oh, Verse. Yeah. Okay. So, fine. So Simon. Yeah. Um, we did actually have a question from someone who couldn't attend today. His name's Mike Brown. He said um, he was asking about the educational stuff. So that seems like a good segue. Uh, he mm -hmm. said something about he had he had read that you were doing uh, part of this was uh, focused on on your son. Any do you want to share kind of the background of how you got involved with it? And what, oh well, what it sort of started about? with yeah, it started with him in a way, and and my daughters so were sitting around the um, you know the dining room table uh, twenty years ago. <laughs> And they were describing their education at school in what was then called Information and Communication Technology, ICT. Um, and they were, they treated it with contempt. They they thought it was very boring. Um, and it was how to underline in words and how to make things bold. And they thought it was ridiculous, and which I agreed. So uh, I felt that there was no connection between the subject they were learning at school and the discipline to which I devoted my professional life, because I think it's so deep, rich, fascinating, interesting, innovative, full of ideas and so forth. Um, and that's not true in biology. In biology, what you learn at school does have some connection with the professional thing, obviously at a much more elementary level. So um, the more people I talked to, the more we discovered, actually, what we're doing education-wise in computing is bonkers, right? It's, it's just not a good education but then i began to think well if everybody thinks that maybe all we need to do is to figure out what we want and everybody will, and we'll just do it um there doesn't seem to be anybody defending the status quo and so it turned out in fact we we um, formed a group called computing at school if you type in computing at school into your web browser you'll get um kaz's web page it's a very guerrilla um bottom-up volunteer-driven movement really but we wrote a curriculum that said maybe we should think of computer science as a foundational discipline that we teach our children, all of our children, not just the geeks of the future, all of our children, just in the same way that we teach elementary physics or elementary maths to all of our children, not because they're going to become mathematicians or physicists, all of them, some of them will, but um, a minority, but rather because it means they can understand and have agency in the natural world that surrounds them. Um, and the digital world that surrounds them is even more, it almost presses closer upon us. And so understanding something about how these mysterious and wonderful machines work is really helpful in somehow being empowered, being able to make good critical judgments about them. And so we successfully made that case. And the English National Curriculum now says every child from primary school onwards should learn the fund fundamental principles of computer science. I think England is the only country in the world that says that in black and white. That's pretty amazing. 
Um, turning it into reality is a whole different ballgame. I could plenty more to say about that. Um, but the the principle is now right there in black and white in national policy, which is amazing. Sorry, I'm so did, did Doug Lee help you uh, name it uh, Taz, or was that your own idea? Uh, yeah. Oh, um, I, I don't know. We just started calling it computing at school, and then we, we thought of snazzier titles and then thought, oh, we've been calling it computing at school for a bit, and it does what it says on the tin, so we'll stick to that. So CAS. Yes, it's not compare and swap. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, you can build what you need out of CAS. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, um, incidentally, CAS is um, very open. It's you; anybody can join it. It's free. You can join it from anywhere in the world, and it gives you a little window into. It's very much focused on school education, and it's focused on teachers rather than students. So, the only people that we don't allow to join CAS are students themselves, because generally speaking, teachers don't want their own students to hear them saying, "Ah, oh, I have no idea what I'm doing." Okay, I found the link. So, so can you can you just? Dis- can you describe uh, what's the primary focus of it? Is it more like being to, being able to use and understand um, like computers on a deeper level or understanding and being able to maybe design well, that's an interesting algorithms question, Simon, actually. Or... Um, you know, if you figure out what, if you, if you thought, okay, so I have carte blanche to write what I like about what, a child, you know, starting at age six onwards should learn about computer science in order to be an empowered citizen in the way that a bit of science does. What would you put in it? That's not a that's not an easy question to answer. So I can tell you what what we've done. We've put we said you should understand um uh well you should understand and be able to do programming. Right? Programming is sort of it's not the purpose, but it's a very powerful vehicle because it carries everything else with it. You should understand about that computer um you know, computer computers execute things step by step. They're very moronic. They just blindly follow a sequence of instructions to do something, and they will. Um, and so students can write little programs and um, see it doing that, and then they get frustrated when there are bugs, and um, and that gives them a better understanding that the programs that they use, like the one that we're using now, might actually have bugs in it. Um, and so it's um. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'll I'll um, put a link in the chat to um, uh, a sort of good. Uh, starting off point of um, placeholders for um, yeah. Uh, There's also for, a Google Docs also came with the this. email link I sent you that we use as a shared whiteboard that we put links. Oh, ah, oh, okay. I should do but that. You can put it in the that. yeah chat um, too. Uh, when I first yes. started learning programming, I had my mini existential crisis. When you get that pop up, that's like, "Are you sure you want to run this code?" Yes, no, and it's like, um, yeah. Right, but the button that says yes and the buttons that says no is just a label that was typed by a programmer. How do I know that they didn't get it backwards? And yes means no, and no means yes. And how uh-huh. can I trust any of this software? Um, that's right. And if you're going to talk about if, if an AI is all flavor of the month at the moment, how are we to give our children some notion about? Um, uh, but because it seems like a very pure form of magic, uh, and yet you know we all know that you have to be thoughtful about AI and that it can hallucinate and all it's really doing is learning from data and if you give it biased data um, it can only learn from that it cannot make generalizations about data it hasn't seen um, and so I put a link in the in the um, in the Google Doc to a good collection of curated bookmarks that I hang on to and if you look at the very first one which is called um, um, our vision for teach computing here uh, that's a video uh, featuring yours truly um, that um, sort of gives you the um, the bird's eye view of what we're trying to achieve. Excellent. Um, well, let's let's see if we can get some more questions in from people here. I think, Thala, you, you had something you wanted to ask specifically. Yeah, that's right. So I am interested in better understanding the Haskell internals. And mm-hmm. so I can't claim to know spineless, tagless G machines very well. Um, but as I understand it, um, so it's the mid end to GHC and it's a graph of all closures and it can specify that once it is evaluated for the first time, it will be replaced through the update stack with its computation to then, uh, 
save that computation for later. Um, and that's the mechanism for enabling uh, lazy evaluation. So I'm, uh, I mean, we're all compiler geeks here. So um, I think we, like, I'd like to hear more about how uh, this lazy evaluation with the update stack is different from more traditional compiler IRs. Well, um, let's see. This is the um, with the SDG machine. Uh, I'll put again in the in the chat. I'll put the um, um, that's the one for the. Uh, mm -hmm. This is quite a long paper, but it's written in a very what's the word the tutorial style. But if I was if, to the sort of hundred thousand foot view of um, it accepts a very large language on the front. So Haskell is a very large language. Type checks it, um, renames and type checks it, and then desugars it into a very small language that is not actually the SDG language. Um, it's just Lambda Calculus plus Let and Etrec um, and data constructors and case. Um, so, and it's called, we call it GHC's core language, uh, rather unoriginally. Um, and it's, um, um, there's a, uh, let's see, a talk about this that you might enjoy. Was it Zuri Hack? Um, uh, I think it was last year, actually. Zuri Hack 2022, perhaps. Um, uh, Zuri Hack, is it? Uh, let's see if I can find a. Maybe you can uh, that, yeah. mention something, um, let Matt look it up, see if Matt wants to try to look it up and then carry on with. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, Somewhat, the, I think there's. I think the talk that I gave last year at Zuri Hack is um, is all about this core language. So, the interesting thing that probably GHC's one of GHC's most distinctive features is that most compilers do something similar to what I've described. They, you know, have some surface language and then they have some IR. So, core is our main IR, um, but the IR is often either not typed or sort of informally typed, loosely typed. Um, core is completely statically typed. It's a. Um, it's actually uh, based directly on system F omega. Um, so it has, as well as little lambdas, that's the lambda calculus, it has uh, value lambdas, it has type lambdas, which are often written big lambda A dot blah. Um, and as well as term level applications, it has type level applications. Um, and this turns out to be enough to mean that throughout the entire optimization pipeline, GHC keeps a statically, completely statically typed program. So you can run a little type checker on the on the program at any stage in the pipeline and of course if the compiler hasn't got any bugs that type checker will always succeed but it's a really good way of finding compiler bugs um, when it uh when that type checker fails uh, we call it just it's a form of lint really so that's the yeah, i imagine if you do a transform and it's no longer typed that's quite the flag exactly yeah uh, and think about how much better that is than you do a transform it's now ill typed you compile it to machine code you run it there's a seg fault Right, that's a long path back to the bug in the compiler, right? It's not even the bug in your the program you wrote. Um, so it's fantastic to have a statically typed intermediate language. It's really been helpful to us in developing the compiler. So, so that's other, our dominant IR. The other Simon likes the fact that you call it the core language because he named his language the core language. <laughs> <laughs> Something about Simons and cores. Yes. Um, uh, so there you go. So uh, let's see. And and core really is a very small language. It, it, of course, being a being since compiler is written in Haskell, it's described as an algebraic data type. This algebraic data type only has eight constructors. Right? There's variables. There's application. There's let. There's lambda. Um, there's uh, literals and a couple of others. I mean, it's really very very small. So this entire gigantic Haskell language gets squeezed into this tiny IR, that's then remorselessly optimized um then finally at the end to come to back to your question about stg at the back end of the compiler we convert core into stg uh, and thence into c minus minus and thence into machine code but that's all the sort of back end stuff stg is actually quite like core but has a lot more invariance like in stg um a um uh, a function is in, in a call, the arguments are always variables or literals. They're not ex arbitrary expressions. In core, they're arbitrary expressions. So SDG is in a normal form, for example. But to, and, it's, and it's more highly decorated. SDG is decorated with three variables um, at every um, let binding. And core does not have that. So, but, but they're close, core and SDG.
So in retrospect, would you layer it the same way if you were starting from scratch today? I think I'm, I really like this design, actually. If anything, I'd make more of it. Um, so uh, I said that core is well typed, that is, it's statically typed. Now, in, in STG, we almost throw all the types away, almost. Right, because we can turns out we can get some optimizations there that if you're completely static typed are hard to get at. But even STG is well kinded, which means to say that when you have a function and you pass it an argument, you'd better make sure that the calling convention matches. Otherwise, you'll get some kind of seg fault at runtime. Right. Um, so the argument had better have the right representation if it like uh, the function. If the function is expecting a pointer and an unboxed float in two different registers, the caller had better pass a pointer and an unbox float. Um, so uh, um, in GHC, this is a very, another interesting thing about GHC that's that's still still for being fully worked out is that in a way the types, um, uh, let's see, an int and a character both have the same representation. They're both represented by pointers. So when we go from core, which distinguishes between integers and characters. In STG, we don't distinguish between those two anymore, we collapse them to just the pointer type. So it's as if core is well typed, but STG is well kinded. And we have a whole paper that you might enjoy called Kinds Are Calling Conventions um, that is uh, that that tries to articulate this idea that the um, the calling convention of a function is expressed not so much by the types of its arguments, but by the kinds of its arguments, the kinds of the types of its arguments, I should say. Would you scale so that, that argument all the way rambling. up to services? Oh, go ahead. Two web services again. are the same. Would you scale that all the way up to services? Two web services are the same kind if they have the same API. Um, at the in what I've been describing, I think I would. Um, the the sort of SDG invariants that I really don't really want to make sure if I call a function expecting a pointer, I give it a pointer. If I was calling a web service, then I would want to say, if I call a web service that expecting, a, you know, a pointer to a table of something or other, it had better be given a pointer to a table of something or other, not just a pointer. Um, so I would expect web services to be typed as it were at the level of types rather just at this lower level representation, which is more suitable for the back end of a compiler. Thank you. Um, but Talia, just to go back to your question about the STG language and updates and so forth, I think in, in retrospect, the, the STG language is nothing very special. There have been lots and lots of papers about um, abstract machines for running purely functional programs. So we go from core to STG. The transition from STG to a pretty imperative code like LLVM or C++ is pretty, it, it's a pretty straightforward transformation. Um, to get to executable code, and then you can then you can optimize that uh, with your LLVM compiler. Um, and yes, there is a stack, um, but the and the in GHC the stacks that are maintained by um, uh, by the runtime live in the heap. They're heap objects because we expect to spawn thousands, perhaps millions of threads, and they're all little green threads, little very lightweight threads that live in the heap and are garbage subject to garbage collection. We don't just have a handful of big stacks with um, you know memory. Um, what's the word? Uh, memory, empty memory pages at the end, operated, yeah. allocated by the operating system. Right. Well, TLV managed, so you, virtual memory. Yeah, yeah that's so, right. Yeah, we do we do not do that. So with the transition from from core from the type to to the kind version, do you yes. do some early type checking? Uh, I mean, you, you know the message signature, right? Uh, the the method signature, the function signature. Yeah. Do, you do some yeah. early type checking to make sure that the kind will even though the kind is like a lower representation uh, that it will eventually match or is that a runtime error if you pass in something like you said the table pointer, right? No, the, the um, yes, but the type system is already guaranteed that, yeah. I mean, so so your, your source program said, I'm calling this function, which was maybe from a library. And so we've already type checked it. We've already checked that when you call that function from the library, you are passing something uh, of the right type, right? So yeah, that's what I was going to say is that so you by definitely, the time you, you get know, the... Yeah, by the time you get there, and let, if the compiler's right, everything should be fine. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So it's more like an internal consistency check. But I found that the the act of thinking, what are the invariants that this particular IR guarantees? If you can state those invariants, then you can 
uh, then that's a, something for you to, uh, what's the word? It's an intellectual lever. It's something that every optimization pass must maintain. And it's something that you can check. So by the invariance, I mean, I mean things like this core program is well typed, right? It should be if the compiler is bug free, but it's a very powerful invariant. Um, what I was going to say is that at, at the high level, before you before you lower, like you're much stricter at the highest level, yes. right? So the checks you're doing type wise at high levels are super insanely strict, yeah, because they're enforcing language semantics. As it drops down and everything eventually becomes a word or a byte or a bit or whatever, like types get much more loosey goosey. So your only real your only real strength in terms of the type system is at the very highest level. So you want to make sure that you catch all the errors there so that as you drop down, you get more flexibility in how you optimize. Yeah, that makes sense. An extreme example of this higher level pickiness is that um, in Ascol, you can declare, you can say new type age equals int. Uh, well, muck age of int. So that means that age is represented by an int, but they are two different types. So if you pass an int to a function expecting an age, the type system will reject you, even though, of course, at one time, you know, if you pass an integer to a function expecting an age, well, an age is an integer, so something would run, but you might pass a negative number, for example. Yeah. So, yeah, it's the, the type system is much more picky, or you can make it much more picky um, than the, the back end part. I think it does get looser, you're right. Anyone else want to volunteer a different question? Oh, yes. So I had a question. It's sort of related. So um, I was watching the compiling without continuations talk at Haskell oh. Exchange 2017. Yeah. And so, you know, the way I see it, there are two interesting IRs. There's sequent core, and then there's this new GHC core with join points. And so um, in your talk, you said that sequent core wasn't worth it in the implementation complexity. And so I was reading the papers and I actually find sequent core to be more elegant because you can actually have this duality where you can always take the inverse of a sequent and move it to the other side. And of course, now in the paper, you ended up, you had to fit it with GHC to make Wait, it. Wait, Alan, wrap it up, ask a question. Well, so the question I have is whether, you know, sequent core is actually worth it or not because I mean, like, is uh, it simply the GHC? That's that a good question. Or, or Why is sequent core worth it or not? Let, let's just frame it for, for everybody what sequent core is, right? So, um, so um, here's the idea that the um, if you look at the logical foundations of functional programming, um, there's a very close relation between um, uh, this sort of proofs as propositions idea that a lambda term is a proof of a um a theorem that's described by its type um and all and the typing rules for the lambda calculus for the simply typed lambda calculus are that they, they are framed in a in a framework called natural deduction and that kind of, so so the natural deduction approach to thinking about logic leads you to the lambda calculus as the lambda language in which you express proofs um the amazing thing is that it's also this incredibly useful programming vehicle now Zena Ariola's question to me was this there's another way to approach um uh, logic uh, using sequence so-called um in which more stuff happens on the left of the turnstile than um than does in natural deduction and associated with um sequent deduction as opposed to natural deduction is um a different calculus called that you might call the sequent calculus so her question to me was, if the lambda, you fact that you know we use the lambda calculus as the intermediate language for uh, GHC, what would happen if we use the sequent calculus instead? It's clearly equally expressive, um, but it comes from a difficult, different logical foundation that doesn't make it better or worse. But her question was, well, let's try it and see whether it would be better or worse. And initially, we did find some things that we thought would be better. Um, so uh, we actually made quite a big experiment. Um, about actually we did it in the context of GHC to take our lambda calculus to convert it to this new calculus which is another data type in Haskell it's just another syntax right um, and then optim then we built a little optimizer for that and then converted it back so this way we could sort of play with doing this without completely re-engineering the whole of GHC but it turned out to be pretty complicated and the main so there's a bit more to the sequent calculus. If there's more data constructors, there's more things to do. So every optimization path, there's more cases to take care of. So we then 
started to say, well, I, so I was a bit dissatisfied with this, saying, well, Zina, you haven't um, persuaded me that we should re-engineer GHC to use sequence calculus instead. But what good things have we got? And it turned out to be this thing about join points. And then we figured out a way to take the ideas that had been generated in this sequent calculus, sequent logic space, and transplant them back into lambda calculus space um, and use them directly. And that led to this paper called Compiling Without Continuations. So we would never have come up with that paper, or I would never have come up with that paper, had we not been on this digression into really the logical foundations of programming that's why i think so great about functional programming is you know all these heavy duty logicians and you know what seems like very esoteric esoteric theory has direct practical applications in a compiler um, so well, i think that the net the net is that as far as i know i mean i could be proved wrong maybe you can build a calculus a compiler based on sequent calculus but as far as I know, it's just it's simpler to build it on Lambda, and you can get all of the goodness, essentially all of the goodness, by using this join point idea that we could talk some more about, but it's described in the paper. Well, well that's where I'm I'm interested. Is it, it, you know I was reading more about the sequent calculus, and there's mm -hmm. a there's a one sided sequent calculus, and so it turns out you can have the number of connectives and the number of rules by just mm -hmm. moving everything to one side. Okay, so go for it. I would say, okay. you know, just try it. Build build. A, in fact, you could build a little. Um, uh, you know, plug-in for GHC that took the Lambda calculus form, converted into this one-sided calculus, optimized it there and converted back. You could do the experiment. Right. Yeah. I have a, I so have a... the fact that we tried and failed doesn't mean that, um, you know, you can't do it. Maybe it's a, it's a rich and complicated world. Go so, for it. So I have, I have a lower level question because this is more theory than I'm, I'm up for. You say join point. This is not like fork join. What, what does this join point mean? This is not, this is not fork join as in parallelism. Yeah. This is a join point as in, if in C, if I say, if blah, 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 then do this, else do that, all followed by print X, right? Then the control flow goes, there's a little, there's an if, and then you go out and do the then branch yeah, and diamond. the end branch, yeah. and then you come back together and the print, yeah. right? That's yeah. the join point. Okay. That's the join point. So how can you express that in a purely uh, functional language? Well, one way to do it would be to say, if uh, oh and it might not just be print x there might be lots of stuff to do right so a natural way to do it in a uh, can i type into the yes uh, where are we in our google doc code block for copy okay yeah, let's type the code block if i want to say um i'm going want, to my, copy in, that code block so the next person has a blank block oh i see I how do i i should have made several copies before yes. there you go yeah make it make a copy thank you I'll just, now i can type into the copy you made good um oh um, well, that didn't work. Well, that screwed uh, I screwed that up. We, we tied somewhere in there. Uh, yes, I'm going to type in here. So um, uh, uh, I, I could say something like this. If um, uh, um, uh, you know something, then I can say, uh, you know, let um, x equal, you know, yes, something. In, in, in uh, yes, that's right. In, and then I can say jx, j applied to x. Right. Um, else, let y equal something else. In j applied to y. So this is the this is the so join points are the fee functions, right? right. And then I need to define j beforehand, uh, which is my right. my join point. Now the trouble is that um, you know what to do um, what to do after. There you go. So the trouble is that left to itself, if you read the STG paper. Um, Talia, you'll find that this allocates a closure for y. It's after all, it's a function, and typically we allocate function closures, right? So it allocates a closure for y, which is not very efficient. But what you want to do is just adjust the stack oh. and jump. And the join point idea was just systematically formalizing the idea of adjust the stack and jump, um, so that everything then works uh, smoothly in um, um, uh, in, you know, you're just optimizing. It's still a functional program, but it compiles into something that you can have. It you have an operational guarantee you get good code out of it. That's the, that's the that was the join point. It did nothing to do with parallelism, Cliff. Right, right. No, and, and we many of us here are very familiar with uh, SSA form. We would call that a fee function. Yes, yes. And, so and it's a yes, jargon problem of some kind, and and a representation because function functional programming with fees is a little different. 
Really so fine. the interesting thing here is that these these fee functions, these J functions here, they're yeah. perfectly first class functions actually, and we can do we might do strictness analysis on it and say, oh, this function is strict in its argument, or we might say it's got you go do dead code elimination because it doesn't actually use its argument as it turns out. So right. all of the optimizations that apply to ordinary functions also apply to these J's. That's very nice. They're just ordinary functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do a lot of optimizations around fee functions as ordinary. Ordinary members of whatever the IR is, they're not That's particularly right. special. Yeah. If I define yeah. some symbol on both sides of the join and then join, that will be available under it or? Well, let's write it as a functional program. When you say define something on both sides, do you mean if I said in my code here, um, oh, I can I, let me go back into well, you can, my- You can go make block. another code block. Um, Put a let yes. X on both sides of the if, is yes. X available afterwards? Uh, yeah, so it's not unless you pass it to the, you have to explicitly pass it. So if you say, you know, um, X equals blah, um, Y equals something. If you only pass Y, this X um, is, you know, this this X is, is not available. No, it's just ordinary functional programming scoping. Yeah. Um, if you want to pass it, you can. Um, so you could pass it like this. Um, but then, of course, you've got to make sure all the calls have it. And then you could pass. So typically, programmers don't ever write these join points explicitly themselves. Um, it mostly comes out when you've got something like, uh, let's see, um, when you've got, if I'm doing case, uh, let's say null x's. Uh, let's just say, or maybe I, I'll, I'll do case null x's of. And then we might say, well, um, so this is just an if, really. Now, what's null? Null x's is itself just a case on x's. Um, ah. Uh, and if it's nil, I'm going to return uh, true because it's, the list is empty. It's just a null is just a thing that tests for an empty list. I, you, I'm sure you do exactly this in in you know, exactly this is done in lots of compilers. Uh, false. Um, now, now if now in now inline null. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, yeah. uh, now now we get case of case, da 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 da, yeah. of and then we get the true and false. So now we got to do the sort of what you would I would, you you could call it case switching. It goes by lots of names. Right. Every compiler has this, right? Right. We're going to move the outer case around the branches of the inner case. Yeah. Um, and that involves a lot of code duplication, or can do. Uh, so it looks like this now. Um, right. But to avoid the code duplication, uh, GHC is just going to make um, join points okay. that shares the code duplication. And then if it turns out that they're only used once, well, it'll get inlined. Or if it's small, it'll get inlined as we inline small functions. And if it's big, we won't inline it. We'll just jump to it. Right. Does that make sense? So it's all very simple, actually. Um, okay. Nice and very standard. There's nothing really. Right. The only original thing here, I think, is that it is not that the this kind of compiler transformation is original. Everybody does it. It's just that it shows up in a particularly sort of simple lambda calculus -y kind of way. We don't have to add something new to the lambda calculus to make this play out nicely and efficiently. Right. Yeah, certainly in the land of. Uh... Graph-based IRs, which is where I'm coming from, yeah. you get these graph patterns all the time that have nested branching ifs, ifs and elses, where the output of one feeds directly into the next one as a true-false test, and they're just redundant back to back to back. Yeah, you you roll them up internally. Yeah, it's a straightforward thing. This is quite a common thing. Yeah. All right, I'm going to stop to share and see if somebody else wants to ask a question here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was going to ask you. Um, so, in the in the in the long history, I want to say Haskell started with doing lazy evaluation very very early on. Yeah. Um, in the long history of it, do you think? Uh, I mean, how well did it play out? Like like. Haskell does this. It is a the, the sort of super lightweight threading thing is an, an idiom that comes around and comes and goes. But I would have said lots and lots of lazy calculation things are not super common explicitly in languages. And maybe there's a connection here I'm missing. 
So how did laziness as a language feature, as a major language feature, play out? Um, so historically, it was super important um, because uh, in two different ways. The first way is laziness was the valiant cry. So this is more of a social, social thing than a, um, a technical thing. At the time, uh, lazy functional programming was quite a new thing. Um, and it, it seemed extremely weird and unusual. How could you possibly program with these potentially infinite data structures? It was all amazing. It was like beyond drugs. It was sort of like, oh, wow, uh, this is incredible. You could do these simple, beautiful, modular things. Um, by the way, read a paper called Why Functional Programming Matters by John Hughes, really a long time ago, gives a good exposition of why laziness is a direct foundation for a certain sort of modularity. Right, that laziness promotes modularity. So laziness was the initial value in crime. Very good. So the um, second thing about laziness was that it meant that we had to be pure. Right? If you got a, let's say, a lazy list, and um, the elements of the list are constructed by, you know, as print three or you know, open that valve. You know, the first element of the list says print three and return seven, and the second element of the list is, you know, launch the missiles and return twenty nine. Well. Which order are those effects performed in? Are they performed at all? In mm -hmm. a lazy language, it depends only on the consumer of the list. Right? Mm -hmm. Because lists are lazy. They don't do anything with their arguments until they're poked. So what that meant was that in Haskell, there was no temptation to uh, add side effects to the language, or at least there was a huge disincentive to add side effects, because if you could ever write a function that said, um, you know, uh, launch the missiles and return three, then you would never know when or even whether the missiles would be launched. So the, the slogan is, laziness forced us to be serious about purity. And that meant that for about 10 years, Haskell really didn't have any decent form of I.O. The initial um, form of Haskell really just took a string and returned a string. That was it. That was all the thing could do. Um, after it was about 10 out, years? Oh, uh, no, that wasn't 10 years. Then, you know, after about a year and a half, we said, well, that's not terribly good. Maybe we could be a bit clever. Perhaps we could take, perhaps the program could produce a list of commands to do to the world. Things like print this, you know, you could imagine the program producing a list of the data structure, that is a data structure produces, and it's a list of, um, you know, uh, commands really. So it would, it would say print this and, and do that. that so the side effects are then exported to the, the sinful external world. So the pure functional program produces its data structure and the sinful external world executes these, uh, you know, takes the data structure and interprets it and executes commands, launches missiles and so forth. Well, but the trouble is, where do you get the input? If you open a file, how do you ever get hold of the input? Ah, so we thought maybe it should be a function that returns this list of commands, but it takes as its input a list of the responses, mm -hmm. right? The, the results of the command. Oh, and lazy, lazy evaluation helps us because now we can cough up the first command on the output before we consume the first response on the input. <laughs> so, but this was not fun to program with. It really was no fun at all. Then, and this is another example of theory and practice meeting in this brilliant way, Phil Wadler read work by Eugenia Moji, who's a brilliant logician, and realized that monads could be used to do um, uh, as a structure, program structuring technique. And he was at Glasgow at the time, wrote this paper called Comprehending Monads. And then I looked at this with him and said, but we could do IO this way. And then we wrote a program paper called um, Imperative Functional Programming that explained how to do, how to use monads to do IO, side effecting things in Haskell that allowed effectively to, to, without giving up purity, to mix purity and impurity with a membrane between them that's maintained by the type system. So we could get the best of all worlds. We could write imperative programs, but we could also cleanly separate off this purely functional piece that we really maintained completely pure. So laziness was fundamental to this. Without the, the spur of laziness, the hair shirt of laziness, we would never have done this stuff. Um, and monads have since proved extremely influential in other languages, including imperative ones. Um, so I suppose the last thing is, you know, people sometimes say, well, now you've learned all that, right? So now we've learned that purity is super important. We should program with immutable values. I now think that purity is much more important than laziness. The question becomes, could we now dismantle the scaffolding 
and have a pure but call by value language, a strict language? And the answer is yes, yes, you could. But I think there are some good reasons. I mean, that's never going to happen in Haskell because it's too late. Um, but even if you're starting from a clean sheet of paper, I think there you are know, reasons you might want to stick with laziness. And I think the um, one recent um, thing that you might enjoy is Alexis King's um, uh, um, series of, um, let's see, is it here? Yes, here's a here's a link to one of them. I'll I'll put uh, Alexis King um, on laziness. There's a, she's written a, she's done a series of uh, YouTube um, videos explaining why she thinks laziness is is you know even if starting from a blank sheet of paper, laziness is really important to the programmer's toolkit. And actually, that was a long answer to a short question. Sorry, her name showed up on our list of people that we'd love to have on this uh on this call so um it shoot her a note if you would and and and, and tell her to contact cliff <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah or you could yes well i don't have I mean, her email, so. email oh i'll give you my email <laughs> so i wanted to ask about continuations like in the hudak paper in 1989 he has like three main implementations of io there's streams there's monads and then there's continuations. And like the reason he rules out continuations is because he can't type them properly. So like now, of course, it's there's actually some some blog posts by Edward Kmet that you can uh, type them easily with second order uh, types. And so I was wondering whether you still thought there was a good reason to not use continuations or whether Yeah, I think I think monadic IO just does the job much better. But okay. continuation based IO, I think you'd find it would be very clumsy by comparison. You could try it. All right. I'll try. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I've made all yeah. these decisions for my language. So it's, you know, perfect. right. Um, so I would, I wouldn't say, I mean, I've written JavaScript. I've tried continuation based IO. It's, yeah. uh, I've done it too in JavaScript. It's possible. The Tower of, what are the Tower of Doom or whatever, the Pyramid of Callbacks? The Collapsing yeah. Tower of Callbacks. Yes. Yeah, so the I Triangle of Death. Yeah. Monads let you write C, you know, do direct idiomatic imperative programs directly, um, and 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 stay sane in a function purely functional programming world. It's amazing. Well, there's a difference between the monad syntax and what monad is actually used. So, like GHC, it uses this state monad. You know, it passes around this world token, and yeah. that's, that's so. I see. So, so you're then, saying maybe you could have a different implementation of the IO monad. Perhaps you could, yeah. and maybe it would be more efficient. I doubt it, but you could have a try. Yeah. But then it would be that would be good because that'd be hidden. Then you could, if you say, well, I could just run your Haskell programs faster because I've got a better IO monad. Everyone will love you, right? Right. Yeah. Got well, a lot of stuff to go do there, Matt Allen. Yeah. Uh, so the continuation monad is the mother of all monads. So you can implement yeah. any monad as a continuation. So if you use continuations as the underlying monad, then you've you've won essentially. You you don't need any other monads. And so, therefore, you know that it can't be faster. I don't know that that's true. It's a big no, jump from right. It's more expressive than any other monad. Time. It's more expressive. It's not necessarily faster. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe probably All right. slower. All right, Alan. Let, let me let somebody else have a turn here. In particular, I was wondering if one of the, the students, uh, new students here, had a question they want to ask. See if they, and you can throw it in the chat. Why don't you throw your question in the chat if you don't have a mic? I know. Mooney here, it has mic issues. Uh, put them on the spot and they're not answering. All right. We'll, 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 we'll try a different one here and we'll see people come up with Out other of the Simon, do you have any thoughts about expressing effects using algebraic effect systems that some of the languages do, like the F lang, for example? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think um, algebraic effect is one of the most interesting pieces of, you know, sort of like a research strand that's emerged. Um, it, again, for, largely from theory people initially, but it's turned out to be enormously practically applicable. I don't think I, I think a language called COCA, um, papers about COCA, Dan Lyons language COCA, are really good at explaining what if in effect just uh, algebraic effects are about and how to, how you might embody them in a programming language. I often talk to um, people who understand about effects and say uh you know what effect should that what effect no pun intended should that effect on, should that have on haskell and the answer seems to be actually 
provided you have the right primitives, you can do a lot with a library um, in Haskell, but Haskell is pretty expressive language. And Alexis, the same Alexis King, recently added um, in Haskell. Um, uh, so it's a new, it's a new primitive operation with direct runtime system support. And that in turn enables you to build more effective um, libraries for effect systems. But these algebraic effects, they're not just one thing. There's a whole design space. And I don't think I, I don't have a good sense about navigating that design space. There are quite a few different libraries for effect systems in Haskell. And OCaml recently has grown an effect system, by the way. Um, so they have sort of picked one and built that into their language in some way. Hmm. Um, so I think the jury is still out about what the where the best point in this design space is. I don't think I really know. Um, but it's a hot topic, hot and, interest and interesting. Sally, do you want to have another question to ask? Sure. So um, I'm just wondering what interesting strictness analyses are in Haskell, because I presume that if the um, update stack was um, given to LLVM IR as is, it wouldn't be able to do much with it and get rid of a lot of your lazy calls because there's so few lazy languages, it doesn't make sense why they'd prioritize strictness analysis. So uh, yeah, what kind of interesting stuff is GHC um, doing? And by the time you get to LLVM, you know, you've already lost, right? Even the cleverest LLVM compiler in the world that prioritized lazy evaluation would have no chance because you sort of lost too much structure by the time you've gone to that mm -hmm. imperative language. You know, even, you know, updates are done by, you know, mut mutating stores. It's too late. Um, so GHC, of course, does have a strictness analyzer because call by value is a lot more efficient to execute than call by need. Um, so GHC goes to great lengths to try to work out when a function does in fact guarantee to consume its argument and to use call by value in that case. Um, and so, I mean, if you if you ever want to look at it, it's in um, you know it's in a module called demand now for demand analysis, um, and there's quite a complicated and uh, and sophisticated demand analyzer now. And for a long time, like 15 or 20 years, I've wanted to do a proper paper about it to describe where it's got to. There's a very old paper about the GHC strictness analysis, but it is way, way out of date. But sadly, I've never uh, gotten this paper written. Um, a student called Sebastian Graf is now uh, now working on it there's actually a, a lot to say and it's quite and one of the reasons i want a paper is i want to be sure that the what we have is right because the implementation has got the implementation has outstripped the theory in a way um the implementation is does seem to work and you know, we never get we never really get bugs in you know in reported bugs in Haskell programs because the strictness analyzer has got it wrong but at the same time the strictness analyzer has a lot of code that it's hard to be truly confident it's right so i feel as if we've not done a proper scholarship job on it at the moment working on that. Um, if you're interested, maybe you could help. Yeah, maybe. Thank you. Speaking of implementation code and knowing whether it's right, what are your thoughts on ensuring compiler correctness? And I know that can span from anything from testing to fuzzing to translation validation of particular paths to formal verification of entire compiler. What do you think are the ways to go we are going to see in the near future? I don't know. I mean, there are some projects. I mean, on GHC, all we do is we have a statically typed language to write the compiler in. That's already good. We have um, we compile a statically typed language. That's what we were talking about with this lint thing. So we can do static type checks on the. So that reveals a lot of compiler bugs, but of course not all. It won't. If you switch, if you even if, if you say a take a minus b and you optimize it to b minus a, the type checker will still be perfectly happy. But right? um, so. Um, uh, and so uh, all we then do in GHC is then have a, a lot of regression tests, right? And we have, uh, because GHC is now quite long lived, we have, you know, have, we've had lots of bug reports and every time we fix a bug, we had a regression test. So it's usual traditional kind of thing. You're maybe asking, could we do more? And there are some projects that really have tried to do a lot more. So CompCert is the most prominent one. Um, and it's a verified C compiler. Um, comes out of Inria, but it's involved a lot of other people by now. But it's a kind of multi decade of person year, and I'm talking sophisticated person years, um, you know, uh, 
PhD++ level person years um, to verify a compiler that initially would, you know, was not an optimizing C compiler at all. Now it's got quite a lot of optimizations, but Comset is a truly huge operation. Um, I'm not optimistic anytime soon of formal, you know, full verification of compilers, the proof that says, I know the meaning of the program you put in is the same as the meaning of the program you get out. That's that's the goal. Um, I'm not optimistic of that being in within reach for compilers like a compiler for Java or for Haskell, la languages these sophisticated with that level of optimization anytime soon. I, I think it's sort of still out of reach. Um, uh, what I was going to say. Oh, there's quite a lot of work in testing, though, that I think is probably more promising. There's a, um, that, but compilers are quite difficult to test because the uh, the uh, search space, that is the, you know, the, the, all the programs you could cough up, like you talked about fuzzing, um, is so big, it's so easily to produce a program that doesn't even parse or that doesn't even type check. Um, so to have a chance, you've got to be able to reliably produce lots of programs that do parse and do type check. And that's quite difficult. There's quite a lot of interesting research being done there. Uh, you may have ideas about that if you talked about fuzzing, that you may you may know good ways of doing it. Right. I mean, for what is done in LLVM, there is structured form of fuzzing where you start at a particular pass. This is a particularly useful if you can express something in that pass as a language. So, for example, LLVM, the middle end uses LLVM IR, but the back end passes use different forms of IR, like selection that for instruction selection or the MIR for machine IR. After we have done instruction selection, you can start generating programs at those little languages, in those little intermediate representations, if you would like to stress a particular pass or particular phase mm -hmm. of the compiler. That takes you somewhere, of course, but fuzzing as a dynamic analysis technique is only, only going to take you so far. I know there was an interesting project in the LLVMIR from University of Utah, Professor John Regier. I'm not sure if you mm -hmm. have run across this called Alive2. Which is basically lightweight formal verification, which allows you to verify correctness of small optimizations like peep calls. You can think of a peep call as a rewrite operating on LLVM IR level, and you would like you are interested whether one rewrite refines or preserves semantics of what you start with. And that has actually right. found some nice bugs in LLVM. So that that seems quite promising so far. Can post the link in there. Thinking about the things that I did for C2 for Java, but most of what I did there was about getting the input to the compiler to be deterministic because the inputs were all from profiling driven uh -huh. things. So what got inlined and what got compiled and what the inlining happened and where you took it, whatever, that depended on getting the inputs. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I've got this huge admiration, not not quite envy, but certainly admiration for people who do jitty kind of things. Uh, you know, JT is an ahead of time compiler, and it's already hard enough. How you do all this stuff at runtime, I it beats me, and can actually make it work. <laughs> Made it work. It was definitely a piece of work to make it work. Yeah. All right. Um, I have a question from one of the students here whose mic is busted here. So, and actually, I think it's an interesting question for me too. So, you, you said you're working at Epic on this verse language. Um, is that available? Is there a runtime for public release? Like, what's the status of this verse thing? Uh, well, so the, there's two parallel things going on. One is um, Epic has released a, uh, you know, I think, what are they calling it? Beta verse or something? Uh, and, um, uh, Simon, and so, hang on, Simon. I have a, I have a problem here. You're... It, and it's meant to be the. Okay, I'm I'm losing your audio. I want you to kill your video. Which, in which you um. Yeah, you're you're breaking up very badly. That's a. All right, I am going to make an effort to kill his video remotely and see if I can keep his, get more bandwidth for his, no, wow. All right, so, Simon, we lost you. Oh. Oh, you're back. We uh, lost you like back. 30, 40 seconds. 
Um, it comes and goes. Why don't you kill your video and maybe you'll get some more bandwidth? Yeah, he broke the yeah. lost connection. All right. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Better. Okay, great. Um, uh, where were we first? Like, so well, a... go back 40 seconds. I asked about verse. You said yeah. something along, there was a beta verse and then yeah. like, boom, lost. So there's two things. One is there's a there's a shipping language. So verse is meant to be the language for the metaverse, right? So it's meant to be the language in which um, both end users and developers can write um could describe the behavior that they want for their characters or their machines or the stuff that's going to inhabit their game or their virtual reality or their metaverse stuff. So um, you can write it in C++ today, but that's pretty onerous. There's a language called Blueprints, which is a kind of visual programming language that Epic's used for some time, but that's fairly limited. Verse is meant to fill that gap in the middle. Okay, I thought that Lua would be the other obvious choice. It would be. So one possibility would be to say, let's fill that gap with an existing language. And that's what, uh, and Roblox is indeed using Lua, they are developing a typed version of Lua. But Tim Sweeney, who is the founder and um, managing director of, um, uh, founder and CEO of Epic, is first and foremost a geek, right? He's a uber geek, actually. Um, and he has been alongside making a very successful games company. Astonishingly, he has been developing a very interesting programming language, which is called Verse. Now, we don't absolutely have to have a new programming language for this metaverse stuff we could use lua right um or python or something but tim is but just as i've been convinced you know for the last 40 years that functional programming is just a better way to write programs and i've devoted my professional life to trying to figure out how to make that really true um tim is convinced that functional logic programming is a better way to write programs that's a, like a, a almost like a niche within functional programming um and so and so verse is actually a functional logic language so um, uh, my job is to kind of reverse engineer this quite strange language out of Tim's head and make sense of it and write down its, syntax, its semantics particularly and its type system and how to verify it um, and, and make all that, you know, solid and, and respectable rather than just be Tim's wild imaginings. That's quite exciting. But at the same time, Epic wants to actually release some version of Verse so people get on and, and start writing programs. Um, so the thing that's shipping is like a pale shadow of this full glorious vision. Um, and I, I don't know, Pumby's probably already found the link. Um, uh, I, yeah, I found some main link for searching. If that's the that's the one, and then the link's in the chat probably uh, already, or it's in the uh, doc Yes, already. it's, it's um, uh, uh, where's, the, where's the doc? I had got, got a uh, verse calculus, but I don't have a game. For no, the verse calculus is, so that, uh, yeah, uh, is that, Right. Yeah, that's that's right. That's that's the shipping version. OK. But the um, uh, the the full glory version, or at least a start on the full glory, but essentially we are running quite a big research project. Um, the, the, this programming language is quite strange. And the tools that, um, uh, that the programming languages community has developed over the years are, you know, they're uh, here's the paper. Oh yes, um, and um, are you know they're not they, they don't smoothly adapt to handle fun functional logic programming. Functional logic programming hasn't been studied enough, nearly enough. So so we're doing essentially a big research project at the same time we're we're designing the wings of the airplane at the same moment that the airplane has already taken off. Right? <laughs> So it's a little bit scary, actually, we're doing yeah. um, doing all this at once, but quite exciting. And yeah, Verse really the, is a very cool language. All the popular languages take off sort of mid getting themselves figured out, and then they pick up all kinds of weird, strange, butcherous things because they had to keep some amount of backwards compatibility while desperately the authors are trying to you know get the language finished and sorted out. Yeah. So, so um, Aaron asks, how does it relate to Prologue? So it relates to Prologue in the sense that it has it has things that you would recognize as logic variables in Prolog, um, but it does not have this very top level, horn clawsy, um, first order uh, feel. It's it's more like an enhanced Lambda calculus. So it's like Haskell plus rather than starting from Prolog and adding some functions to it. Um, but you'll get the feel from the paper. Okay, and Levo, you had a question? Uh, yeah, so um, one of the things that people uh, say about um, languages for games is that they're really hard to debug. 
And uh, I was wondering, is there going to be some kind of official debugger? And is it going to be like roughly as good as uh, something like Java or GDB or what's... Oh, good question. So you're that? asking something about the sort of production system, which I actually know very little about. The one that the, the thing that's released has, you know, a little programming environment that comes with it, presumably some kind of debugger. I know nothing about that. Um, so I'm not the person to ask. I would think that because it's, you know, statically typed and there's a lot of verification that um, goes on, I think that, well, you still need to debug your programs, but a lot of bugs are just eliminated because the static type system helps you. But you can still write plenty of buggy programs in a statically typed language, and we will need to be able to debug those. So in some ways, the, the thing that is... Uh, what's the word? Um, let's say brave, ambitious, or stroke foolhardy is that you know Epic is developing in developing a new language. You effectively have to develop an ecosystem for the new language. It's not just a programming language; it's a compiler, it's a debugger, it's a programming environment, it's a database, a place to keep your code. It's a it's a distribution system when you distribute packages and you want to version them, make sure they're up to date. It, there's a whole little ecosystem that goes with it, and that's quite a big deal. And not piggybacking on an existing one is a that's a big choice. But that's what Tim wants to do, and um, I'm thrilled to you know to uh, I'm I'm sort of working more or less directly um, uh, with Tim, and I think he's I I just love the the fact that he has the glowing eyes. He really wants to do it right. Um, quite exciting, um, but of course a, 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 you know. Uh, but but it has technical risk. If you roll backwards in the chat, a few questions. There's a question from Manas. What are the common principles of the different functional languages used during compilation? Is System F a good IR choice? Um, uh, let's see what common principles I see in various IRs. So I don't know. I think that so System F has served us really well. Um, and as I say, I still think that maybe GHC is distinctive in the what's the word the spareness of its IR. Um, so the OCaml folk are. Um, developing a new IR for the for their OCaml compiler, which is, what's it called? Um, F something, it's got F Lambda, I think, or something. But it, it has quite a few more constructors. It's not as as, as spare as um, uh, a system F. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so, um, I don't know. I think, I, what can I say? Just that um, starting with the lambda calculus and adding as little as possible is a great plan, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that that is, yeah, uh, uh, maybe I, I don't, I'm not close enough to the internals yeah. of other major compilers to know much more than that. Yeah, if you don't know, don't, don't, don't make it up. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah, Whatever. exactly. Um, what else? Backwards compatibility. <laughs> Are you thinking about yeah. backwards compatibility? With yeah, yeah. So Tim is Tim is in this is in inverse context. Tim is very keen on backward compatibility, and I think it will be a challenge. It's a huge challenge for Haskell um, because we keep we want to innovate and we want to be um, we want to maintain stability as much as possible. And we spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, and the um, the I think the verse that's shipping today is not guaranteed to be backward compatible with the one that we that will happen. But there will come a point in I don't know. 18 months or two years time i'm not quite sure exactly when when they'll sort of pull down the the drawbridge and say okay now we're going to promise backward compatibility and i i think there's a technical risk there there's a technical risk that we'll lock ourselves into something that we regret um, because yes, but, the other assignment but, but it is a very high priority be, be pick pick it's, one it's hard to do or compatible pick one yeah throw out yeah. throw out the bad old feature and bring the new one on and you're simple or Keep the bad old feature, and now you're comp you're yeah, compatible, but not simple. Exactly. Yeah. Do you have so some thoughts on? I, I don't think Tim has caught. Well, no, go ahead. Okay, yeah, was... yeah, go ahead and finish. Yeah. Yes, I was just curious if you have some thoughts on keeping the language compatible while growing. There's something akin to say hash lang construct in Rapid, or maybe more limited solutions like additions language additions in Rust. Well, I don't think I've got anything systematic to say on that score. So Racket is the language that, because of it has it's based its language extensibility on this very sophisticated macro system. Yeah, that's just scary to me, but fine. All right, what else? So Levo it, said he had a question that he wrote down that he was 
Hold oh, on. Oh, a complicated one. He's going to yeah. ask later. Leave it. You want to ask her a complicated question now? Oh, it's not about programming language. It's just about something he mentioned earlier. Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's kind of long. Uh, I'm going to ask the question and then I'm going to uh, give two quotes to clarify things. Uh, so earlier you said that um, you're going to, you, you have some kind of like school that's teaching people, but not like students, but other people. But um, you said you wanted to, uh, to do it right. But uh, my question is, how do you know what to teach them? Because I find that most of the time, uh, or probably 100% of the time, everyone's just taught wrong. And I'll give you two examples. Um, everyone uh, says that functions should be sh uh, short. And even a couple of months ago, I heard that in a conference. But um, I, I'm going to butcher his name. Uh, John Osterhout, uh, he made the T TCL uh, scripting language. I think mm -hmm. he teaches at Stanford. Uh, he says that functions should be deep. And he didn't mean like a lot of uh, lines in the function itself, but does enough things like call other functions and enough to be deep. So every time I see short functions, I just think the person is just completely wrong and doesn't know what they're talking about. Uh, the other uh, example- That's not a question, is, that's a statement. Yeah, uh, the he other, said two uh, examples to support his question. Yeah, yeah, and then the other example that I think everyone gets wrong is uh, people always like uh, complain about me uh, about me using uh, global variables, and uh, I'm going to quote uh, Sean Parent. Uh, he says, "A shared pointer is as good as a global variable." So uh, functions being short and not realizing um, a lot of sharing of a pointer is exactly like a global parable is things that like people don't seem to know. So I, I think like pretty much everyone is just taught uh, slightly incorrectly, but uh, yeah. How do you know what's, what's the teacher, what not to teach? Are you talking about teaching six year olds or teaching professional programs? Uh, adults. I'm not teaching anybody. When we were talking about computing education, we were talking about school education, by which I mean age six through to 18 in this country. Um, and the, with the great advantage that every single child goes through education. So if you can make a, if you can cause an effect at school on what, how computing is taught and what computing is taught, that will affect a lot of children. Um, so I'm not a I'm not an adult educator. I mean, I used to teach at university, but um, I don't am for the last twenty years. Okay, yeah, because I, I think it's probably uh, pretty important to teach uh, like good programming practices to sixteen year olds, but uh, maybe maybe not at the level I was originally thinking about. Yeah, so I think it's at the moment. I think for you know for school education, I think just getting just teaching programming at all yeah. is quite a big deal. Yeah. Um, at yeah. all so then i think you know i think that's that we're sort of way further in the cycle than you know now let's talk about you know how big your function might want to be or um does it use does it use global variables it's sort of yes i mean that, that does come up at school right so how many because people do write spaghetti code and they do use a lot of global variables and languages like scratch rather encourage that actually since that's the only sort of variables that you have <laughs> um, i i do think um uh, the the more clear you can uh, write, uh, the more clear your uh, code architecture might be. And I yeah. also think that uh, everyone should be able to count uh, binary and know what logic gates are. Those are really simple to teach, in my opinion. Yeah. All right, let's I, go. I think I mean, we've, uh, like, not everything needs to be taught at age six, age 16, whatever. Like, you can start with doing scratch or like drag and drop gaming like game maker learn coding with the basics and then you can learn all your uh yeah. shared pointer stuff when you're refining your technique and you learn that you were doing things wrong like learning's iterative too there's a monarchs can there's... wait like, until age seven <laughs> I feel like there's some question of getting people to useful fast. So there were two languages that were taught in my high school. They gave everyone a week on Visual Basic and a week on Excel. And we did a lot of the same math problems for both. And people tended to get programs that gave them the wrong answer in Basic and gave them the right answer in Excel because 
Excel just had a lot fewer foot guns than basic did. People tended to get the right answer and not have a lot of these fence post errors. And I'm there's something sure to be said of, would, do I want to teach sure you the I thing that is Excel. arbitrarily powerful, or do you want to yeah. teach people the thing that lets them get useful things done quickly? I had, I had fun teaching the 6 to 16 crowd at J. Crete this summer. And there mm -hmm. it was more about getting excitement. Yeah. And then once you got excitement, getting any connection between what they wrote and what happened on screen, like wired in their heads. The, the edit compile debug cycle was my goal, not anything beyond excitement and edit compile debug. And for a couple of the older kids who made that connection, you could see it light up in their face and their eyes. And suddenly they were debugging their own problems and extending and making their little game do cool new stuff that was you know outside of the base, base programming lessons. So I think excitement first at that age, excitement, Win, win, wins, you know, games are a good way to get quick wins. Um, all the things like how big should your function be, that all can wait. Yeah, I, I guess it's it's important to encourage people to ask questions. Like uh, they shouldn't ask the teacher, um, like or they shouldn't be taught like how long or short should the function be, but they should ask the question, well, how long should this function be? Be yeah. and what's my opinion on this right and maybe the answer is it's up to you there's some people who might say this or that it definitely varies by context there's no one right answer and therefore there's no one wrong answer so whatever you wrote is fine for now and maybe you'll change your mind later and that's fine all right i have yeah, some like... more serious questions <laughs> piling up in the chat here um Alan's got one about deterministic in verse versus exception throwing or exception throwing in Haskell having imprecise semantics. I'm not sure what that one's about, but there's something about being deterministic in verse. I thought you were deterministic in Haskell as well. Yeah, so Haskell's deterministic in SEO in the IO monad, um, but verse is... Um, uh, language how you hang on, hang on just a second um yeah uh, deal with that oh you're muted so he has teenagers who have been anxious and uh he might have to break a sudden notice to handle his family yeah teaching sick yeah the, the youngest i think was eight and she stalled out at the fiddling with the sprite yeah pictures I'm, I'm gonna have to go um in a sec because uh, i've got to take my boy to um uh his sort of evening club it's 7 30 in the evening here or 7 20 sure, sure uh, absolutely so uh i was sort of planning six till seven but and, and it's been yeah. a very enjoyable conversation just about the determinism though in verse uh, a distinctive feature about function logic language is, is that instead of an expression returning one value it may can return one or two or seven or zero so an expression yields zero or more values. So in that, uh, but but in ver in most function logic language, the order in which it returns those values is non-deterministic. But in verse, the order in which it returns the values is deterministic, and that supports a form of encapsulation that lets you wrap up the return values as an array. You'll find all that described in the paper. There's quite a bit about how verse is a deterministic language there. In fact, it's right there in the title. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. Um, yeah, it's Thanks. been a lot of fun. Thank you. I'm sorry that sorry sorry to uh, bug out on you, but it's enjoy um, your family do, time. You know, family yes, family yes. trumps. Domestic domestic uh, commitments have <laughs> subsumed. That's, that's I didn't think good. Kenzie was going to want to go to this thing, but he does, so I should take him. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, it's been very nice to meet you all. Thank you for um, thank you uh, for for spending the time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank well, you. Thanks a lot. Uh, and and uh, and uh, just on the Excel front, I've just put in a a link in the, in the thing. Excel really is a functional language now. It's got Lambda. Um, one of my proudest single achievement at Microsoft was to finally get Lambda, which was never, you know, Excel is a functional programming language, and now it's a fully first-class, higher-order, lexically scoped functional programming language. Anything you do in Lambda calculus, and therefore anything at all, can be done in Excel. <laughs> well, I love that they have Excel competitions. And, yeah, uh, that's competitive right. Competitive programming in Excel now. Okay, I'm waving. You can't see me. Yeah, but I say you, you got to go or you're going to be late. Yeah, yeah great. Thanks <laughs> a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye then. Bye. Uh, oh, that was good. So yeah. I, I meant, I, I, did he answer my question? I don't know.
<laughs> well, yes, he said versus deterministic. Um and and it's explicitly deterministic. Uh and he didn't he didn't get to the optimize or not part. Um okay. and I don't know what Tim Sweeney thinks is a good reason. Oh, deterministic is an obvious good answer for understanding what the hell your program's doing. All right. What one of the things I strived for very hard at H2O was deterministic order for like non-associative arithmetic operators on your billion element parallel computation. So despite things getting computed wildly out of order relative to each other, in the end, all the add, subtract, multiply, divides all happen in exactly the same order, but via a parallel log tree that the rollup was identical every time. And that gave us our, you know, bit for bit identical answer in the end out of a parallel computation. That was an important one. Uh, age six is perfect for list because it confuses their neurons for life. <laughs> he calls access a database. No, 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 no. Excel is a programming language. That's somebody else. Here's another link. Okay. Excel does Python. I saw the lambdas go by. Excel actually has a built-in 3D shoot 'em up game. Yeah, I played that. I found that and played that. Yes. Everyone has to compile say, in somewhere. Once you get big enough, you have to put an Easter egg of the doom. Fine. Teaching kids to program makes it very clear that the REPL is very important so people can see feedback immediately and have, just have poke that, around. What is this variable? I'm going to print it. First principles for everybody is getting quick feedback. And, you know, I started when that was what you had. You didn't get these giant layers and layers and layers we have now. So, you know. I had basic um, on a trash 80 and I could poke right, the screen. But I think that's, bits. I think the same is true for someone who's been programming for 25 years. That, yeah. I see people with these big data center cloud things and they try to debug something for a week and make no progress. Right. And, and then eventually yeah. their permission comes through to SSH into a production machine and attach a debugger yeah. and actually run a piece of code in yeah. the live running environment. And they go, oh, that's not what I expected. Yeah. Yeah. That That's yes. So like. I want to be able to attach a REPL to my data center and start asking yeah. questions about the running state. Well, that was my that was my H two O not H two O. This was a, a Azul debugger story. That was get a, a REPL attached. I didn't didn't get as far as a REPL, but I had a complete peek and poke of the running machine and the read the heap and not a poke read the machine and read the profile data and read the jitted code and read the inlining decisions and read the types of the jitted code and all that kind of stuff read the hardware perf counters on the code what uh, was your story for how to audit that because um, i want my developers to be able to debug live running systems yeah. But also, if they start pulling out people's social security numbers right. and credit card numbers from the live running systems, it would be nice to have I, an audit trail that they with, did that. Right. I started with, I have a, a, a JVM, I don't understand what's going on. And I have thousands and thousands of customers who have JVMs, they don't understand what's going on. So I said, if you can attach a debugger, why not attach a browser? So I said, it's just as open as a debugger. If you can get on the system... So it didn't, it didn't it port the, the port was, was commonly available, but you could have turned it off, but there was no other auditing going on. And my theory was just, if you want to, like, we won't ship this with it turned on unless you ask for it, but all the clients who saw it first thing, they was, oh my God, give it to me now. And then, you know, of course it ships with it then, um, followed by, we can monetize it. And then they put it behind a paywall on a site. Um, but if you can attach a debugger, why not a browser? So you got silence. What is word, Cameron, or curd or dirt, as opposed to turd, which I understand. Well, there's can it run Doom or does it run Doom or will it run Doom? Will it run? Oh, was it? Yeah, will it run Doom? Yeah, okay. <coughs> will it run Doom is not a valid question. Everything will run Doom at some point. Apparently. By the way, congratulations on your baby. <laughs> congratulations on my what? On your baby. Hey, yeah, it's a follow the link. It'll make more sense. Oh, I'm, I'm I missed the connection there. I'm sorry. Background noise in my place. It's the Twitter link. It's it's funny. Click on, click on the link. 
Oh, I see. No, it's dangerous to click on links you post in short term. Lose, okay. uh, cool. And it's cool. running Doom on. Well, I mean, I'm... come on. That thing probably has more programming, uh, more more processing power than the old 8-bit computers, right? Oh, easily, easily. I right. saw that one. It's got is Bluetooth it, built in. Is it actually running on it or just yes. forwarding to the display? It's, it's a video on the but it's not... So originally, so game. originally he had a video he played on it, and then he actually ported Doom to it. I mean, it's a embedded a standard embedded chip, so I mean, C compiling not that hard, right? Wow, you're fine. I've I've seen it on an electric toothbrush with an attached display. Same yeah. same thing. Okay, I it's, think it's I have to be. It's going to be these times when somebody's in their Tesla. Playing some first person shoot 'em up on the you know the the display there and not attention to their driving they're on autopilot and they're gonna grab the wheel and do something stupid. You know, it's coming. Fine. It would be much cooler if you used the wheel to navigate Doom. So that would be look that would look exactly. really good yes. from the outside. Yes, they'll have disassociated, it'll be all fly by wire. You got a game with them playing Mario Kart. You know, and then the autopilot says, hey, I got a tricky situation. I'm disengaging. You got to take over. <laughs> Officer, I couldn't see the speedometer. The YouTube video was covering it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Plus 10 hit points when you run over a pedestrian. Exactly. Exactly. Uh-huh. 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 <laughs> yeah, I'm not ready to see self-driving cars. Self-driving planes? Yes. Self-driving cars? No. It's fine. Right, I'll say, I, I thought the laziness of... as a method to enforce purity was interesting. I've often sort of wondered, <laughs> you can make a lazy function in any programming language. You just sort of take lambdas instead of taking yeah, parameters. In my ass, and I've sometimes watch. wanted a syntax that says, look like I'm a normal function, but actually wrap everything in a thunk and don't call any of the parameters oh, until I ask for it. I'm okay with the tractors, Chris. You're on a field. You're not running anybody over except the farmer. And as for Manas, I had no blockage on my YouTube ad blockers as of yesterday. As far as I know, no one's got ad blocker. YouTube hasn't blocked ad blocker. I do play a lot of YouTube videos on like Firefox, which like all your ads go bye bye, and you know all the YouTube crap goes bye bye too. I I, re I remember that I read a couple of weeks ago that YouTube is trying something um, where the video wouldn't actually start at all, like nothing is playing when you have an ad blocker. Right. Okay, all right. It didn't. It, I didn't bite me last night. Here I am. I'm. I'm. This guy. Well, that's just like an expanded GIF. And it yeah, I don't, I don't know. Since I started watching more YouTube videos on the television, uh, they kind of forced me to go for premium. It the, the amount of ads is just nuts. Welcome once again. No, okay, so I just clicked on Lido's Law about the lockpicking lawyer, and no ads. Pop right up. I'm in Firefox. He, he says, you know, haha, no ads. Actually, these these tech companies, like they always do these canary, like often do these canary deployments, right? And yeah. it's actually pretty terrifying because this is like a bit like watching into the future, but you're like a chosen one. You're like from a yeah. prophecy and you can see what your life is going to be like in maybe a year. And yeah. if the if the you change is sound... really bad, then like, yeah. You make it sound good. You're the chosen one. That yeah, but like the, yeah, but you're the chosen one to to like help the world, uh, like yes. you stop must... YouTube from yeah blocking. Yeah. You're already, uh, you're already I don't know. I've read a fair amount of fantasy. I feel like it never goes well for the chosen one. You get no, clockwork no. orange. We're gonna tie you into this chair. We're gonna pinch your eyes open. We're gonna force you to watch these ads. Awesome. Uh, not even kidding. Uh, I think it was like two days ago. Um, I opened up a YouTube video on my phone. And there was a two minute ad that was not skippable. Right. And that's why I don't watch YouTube videos on my phone. Let me let me guess. It was a 30 second YouTube thing you wanted to watch. Oh, no, it was actually a pretty good 15 minute one. But uh, I was in the middle of something. So um, I was really annoyed. But so yeah, the, interesting I, I thing is, um, the interesting thing is to look at how the companies price their ad free models versus their ad based models. And it looks like. I think it was Meta that decided it's $16 a month. So each person using Meta apps, they make 16 bucks a month off of advertising. 
To, to be honest, um, as I said, YouTube kind of forced me to go for premium, but because you can add multiple YouTube accounts or multiple Google accounts, it's actually not that bad. I think you can. Okay, add, like... I'm, I'm with Simon. Let, let's see if we can't steer this back to compilers. <laughs> Who knows what kind of ad block compiler they use? Yes. No, stop, stop. Let's see here. Windows logos. I'm reading back in the chat. There was all these questions. And then way, they bang, the chat scrolled back. Hi, You're talking a bit about Excel. Yes. I think it's incremental computation models pr pretty interesting. Have people what? here done much with incremental computation like adapt on or salsa and rust or whatnot? Rust has an incremental computation model? Yeah, they do. And they're, um, they use it for incremental compilation. They built a generic library called salsa um, and they use that to power um, just deducing what has changed in your program and propagating that through what needs to be recompiled. You know, land of hotspot, everything's an incremental compiler to me. That's the Jimmy I mean, thing. I use Excel, so I do incremental update when I change a box in Excel. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Well, I think the interesting thing is the adaptive part like you because in hotspot you're not changing the program right uh, i'm certainly changing the generated code well not the user changing it and then you adapting your... so you do hot swap in the debugger and then in fact that happens too oh interesting yeah so the the inlining decisions and the semantic meaning of the program do change over time in normal java no debugger because someone can add a new subclass. So I could have a class that I have no children of, and I could know something about it. And you make an instance of this guy, he's not a final class, but there can't be anyone else. So all calls that are virtual are immediately determined to be static, and then it gets inline, and it's all great. Then somebody loads a new class, makes an instance, stuffs it in a global variable, and the semantics of the program are grabbed from this global variable, which used to only be this one guy, but now it's a virtual call, and you inline, blah, 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 it's all wrong, you have to go back and redo. So that sort of incremental recompilation thing is standard fare for Hotspot. Hmm. That was something that confused me with Java, that... The JVM seems to be this super dynamic, throw code at me yeah. at any time, and yeah. I'll rebuild the universe. That's what it does. And yet Java was, give me the whole class path before we start. Like, it's not actually that trivial in Java to say, I'm at runtime going to build a class that does a thing I need, and then load it. Well, you do class. I would very much disagree with that. It's very easy. Uh, you use a class loader, you spin up some bytecode, and you literally just yeah. load it in. Yeah. And in sure. the past, it was even easier because you could use the system class loader. You went around all checks, and you could do weird stuff like create um, a string instance, not calling any constructor at all, and just do whatever you wanted. Yeah. Even even now for ecstasy, I'm busy handwriting. Well, I'm, I'm writing an ecstasy to Java, not even Java bytecodes. I'm invoking the Java compiler in the JVM as just like Java C and then class for name and run the code. So I so just call Java C at runtime with strings. It, there are several ways to produce bytecodes. One of them is to call Java C at runtime. There is a, an API baked into the Java JDK system to help you call the Java C compiler. So in a couple of lines, I call Java C. And it gives me the full Java C semantics, but all in, all in memory-based things. So you have wrappers around what you would have files on disks. If you were expecting to have a bunch of files, he was going to Java C, he's going to invoke in all these different places. There's wrappers for that, so you can make them all in memory objects. Yeah, and, and, and there were... The official there were yeah, and there were many more options. Before the Java C compiler API, there was Bean, Bean Shell. I think that was the thing, which was one. basically a scripting language that looked like Java. And I think it was a super set of Java with a couple of things on top of that, but it also generated bytecode on the fly. There's a bunch of bytecode hackers directly. So ByteBuddy and Java Assist and uh, Asm hey, something. Yeah. Uh, CC something, forgotten name. Right. There's several and they have their pros and cons, but they basically let you systematically program. H2O use Java Assist. So no Java yeah, Assist. And there is actually a jab for um, a new bytecode uh, byte generator API right in the standard library. So to have like a standard thing, which is always up to date with Java, 
which is cool. Oh, is the, uh, there's a new job for that. Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, I think let, me, let me find the address. Yeah, it should happen. So, yes, you can just spit code at the JVM. So, Cliff, I, I've got a question for you. What is your favorite optimization inside C2? Favorite or most obvious performance? There's a couple of flavors here. Well, well, I guess the one that you're you're most happy exists. Oh, that's the, you have the most fun with. That's the people optimizer on the sea of nodes. That's like half of all optimizations outside of loops. So you have to look at the wet the stack of performance things that you do to make things code go fast. The the people optimizer covers everything else. You have to do something about loops. You must have inlining, which totally becomes part of the people optimizer and the AA and what we do for sea of nodes will almost surely inline at the not have it done before it would be in the sea of nodes. And then register allocation stupidly is has a high impact on performance, especially because it goes hand in hand with how much inlining you can do. So of those, the most bang for the least buck by far is sea of nodes, is peoples on sea of nodes. So it looks stupid. It doesn't have this deep giant theory behind it. It's fucking amazingly, prolifically effective, cheap, fast, easy to mangle and write and extend and screw it. On the other end of the spectrum, what was your favorite optimization to write or like the most complicated one? The most, most complicated satisfying. one, not the favorite one to write, most complicated one. Well, there's a you know two-way tie between the register allocator and, and the loop ops. When I started with the loop ops, I limited myself to just like standard, nicely formed for tranny looking loops. And then somebody did this stupid and that stupid. And so I extended it and extended it. And eventually discovered if you didn't line enough try finally blocks, you only ever got irreducible loops. And irreducible loops immediately destroy all standard loop optimizations on the planet. So you had to do partial loop peeling to turn irreducible into reducible. And when I was done, I could take anybody's crappy code, no matter where the fuck it came from, and you would get a nicely nested, tightly made set of Fortran looking loops that then X86 would eat the shit out of. They would just go to town on that good looking code that then they run fast too. Um, but to get there, man, I did every possible loop restructuring hack on the planet, um, short of doing what Fortran would call block a, uh, register blocking, multidimensional array register blocking, which I can't do in Java without some help from the garbage collector to make all their loops, all their arrays be actual rectangles in memory. There's a garbage collector hack that never happened that we knew about at Sun that would, all your two-dimensional, n-dimensional arrays would be laid out as fixed block structure, just like C arrays or Fortran arrays, but with object headers all in between, and a bit in the leading object at the very start of the, of the array that said, the garbage collector has promised that this structure is in fact correct. You don't have to peek at it. And so as long as the GC promised, the loop kept its shape and it was made that way when you first did a new n-dimensional array bytecode, you got it, you had it. Compiler would do one bit check at the beginning and say, this loop is well-structured. I can now do block restructuring on visitation ordering all the matrix, matrix, multiply, hack things, they all apply now. And I could have given you actually Fortran performance. So as long as you were a one dimensional or a nicely behaved two dimensional, I got pretty close to Fortran performance. And then you went in dimensional and the Fortran compiler would start doing blocking things. Couldn't do it. So uh, I got a dumb question. Yeah. So um, I think you said that um, it was mostly you and two other people that did uh, most of the Sun uh, or the Java optimizations. The start was me and two grad student buddies I brought. Um, when I got to Sun, the team, the C2 team eventually grew to seven people. But I would say there was a, a binary distribution of throughput performance and that I did half of all the code and the next guy down did half of all the remaining code and the next guy down did yeah. half of all the remaining code and so on. And the two guys I brought in were not in the, were not the second guy down. They were in the third and like fifth position or sixth or something. Okay, so uh, my dumb, my really dumb question is uh, if you were to redo all the optimizations that you did, uh, 
I, I, I don't know how long you spent uh, writing all those optimizations, but how long would it take you now? Me. Yes, that's exactly well, what I'm asking. So, so, and I had to rewrite a ton uh, this week. So if I had my brain like what, what I was when I was 30 or 40, but I had the knowledge I have now, you could get, I, I, I claim it would have been done a lot quicker. Yes. Um, as it stands like now. No, you're or saying or... we need to get Cliff two PhD students to finish AA. Um, only if I can mind meld with them, which, you know, could happen, but right there, there is a thing there. So right now I have shit, like I have a frozen left shoulder. I am 62. I have a frozen left shoulder. You do not see me lift my left shoulder like this. I'm undergoing therapy and, and acupuncture and massage and physical therapy. And it hurts like hell. And that's very distracting. And that's one of the many things that are now distracting to letting me just like plow in and go. So when I was 20s to 40, I would plow in and go and have just focus out the wazoo. And I didn't understand that I had this crazy focus thing, but I knew that interrupts were painful. Um, and I was kind of abrupt about how I expressed myself. These days, I'm a lot better about helping people understand that. And I know it's true of a lot of other people. And so I get a lot of support that I didn't get back then. So there's some good and some bad, but I do not typically get sort of the kind of deep focused and runtime I used to get because at some point something hurts and I have to get up and move and break my focus. So it is slower. I am slower than I was 20 years ago. So why do you think the standard isn't that we see programming done as pairs of one old wise person and one young smart person? Because and by no the time tolerates. the young smart person becomes an old wise person, you just right. assign and them a new young smart person. No, no one tolerates. You sound like a me. I, you know, I, I've tried pair programming only a handful of times, but there's no pair next to me that makes sense. So then I'm doing shit as fast as I can. Can I talk it out as fast as I can? As I can type it out? No. So something happens. I have a cool thing. I know how to solve this problem. I'm after it. Somebody who's watching doesn't understand my train of thought because I didn't express it because going to words is going to break my flow. Um, I don't know what you're going to gain out of that. So I'm not saying there wouldn't be a benefit, but it wouldn't necessarily be a benefit to forward progress on a project. <laughs> and the benefit for me would be <clears throat> feeling like I'm educating the next generation. I think I have a lot of things that I could teach. Um, if I had somebody sitting next to me and we went to town on a problem and we went back and forth, there was an education process, I would accept that as a cost for how slower I would otherwise be going. I feel that's going on with me and Dibyindu to some extent now, because he wants badly that all parsers have to have a lexer. They must, they must, they must. And I'm like, no, scandalous parsing for the win. So there's some conflict and he's learning. And you know, maybe I learned something different. I understand he doesn't think and understand like I do in the same ways or the same things mean different ways. So, you know, a lot of things I understand really good concept wise, I'm going to use short variable names because this obviously you have to have an array of bytes that you're parsing. You have to have a pointer into it. Why did he need to have giant long names? You're going to mention those names a thousand times. And that's part of the parsing. And there's only one of each. So why not call it buff for the array of bytes and X or index IDX, why does it have to be something long and complicated? But, you know, Debian is in a different place. He needs a longer name. He wants a longer name. Okay. He wants a Lexer. Well, we he, also, a he also didn't learn to code on a 40 column monitor like you did. Like, it was 80. What are you talking about? Oh, I guess Trash 80 might have been 40. Yeah. I mean, I started in 40. And by no, the way, language, it was not language, about. It was not language about. I had could only support two characters in a, in a variable name. So, like, yeah, that's all you fine. Had. I did those kind of things too. You no, know, what I'm um, saying is that context is different. Like you can't expect someone that grows up with a color monitor to appreciate, you know, all the beauty of a green screen, like or of a teletype, or you know. Well, context, but there, there's context changes. I, I'm thinking through. Like I have long, long, you know, lived with color monitors. That's not the issue. I still get to a point case. where I want to read more of what the function is in a smaller amount of space. So my eye doesn't have to wander all over, figure out what's going on. So I remove abstraction layers typically, or if you like, I have a tighter binding, like the thinnest onion layer gets so thin that I pulled off, but I can still see the API shining through. 
It's just not enforced by the language, but I have some discipline. So there's still a Lexer like API. Right now in, in the, the Sea of Nodes project, that Lexer like API has like six interface calls and they only ever need the one buffer and X pointer passed around. So if you were to inline them in, you would lose this tiny thin shim, but you could have it separate as a tiny thin shim. Okay, fine. But that's a lot of how I do coding things. There is only ever a thinnest explicit layer. The actual semantics layer is all there. I just don't have necessarily a written spec to force you to have a separate file to a separate function to go find what these other things do. I break those up at a, at a, at a larger boundary maybe. Yeah. All right. I have been long frustrated, Aaron, by the lack of ability of me to, to find a way that's useful pair programming to show people, hey, see ya. And, and instead, I observe people say, well, you can't do that, or this is hard, or that is hard. And I'm all I'm thinking is, it's because you're throwing roadblocks in front of yourself. Quit doing that. And, and you know, why are you doing this the hard way? And they're like, but that's the only way there is. So the only way I know, or only something, there's always a reason, but I can look and say, dude, quit doing that. Quit adding layer upon layer upon layer. It just gets in your way. Why are you adding these layers? But you have that's to be able I... to see it. The other day I was working with someone and there was one quick change that I needed them to have on their thing. So I wrote it, made a Git patch, and just sent them through the Slack app. Here is the patch. Please apply it. Okay. And his response was, why not make a branch on GitHub and push this up so that they'll pull it down? And right. about five right. minutes exactly. later, he's sitting there trying to reserve merge conflicts between his branch and master so that he can do the merge so that he can pull the patch. And it's like, I, right. I sent you a patch through the chat app, just like apply the patch. Right. Right. Um, exactly. But if you don't know that, oh, you can actually just apply a patch because you've only ever used a workflow that went through GitHub. The idea that you could apply a patch without internet connectivity is, you know, uh, yeah, internet and coding. I, I I long had bad. This is this is a history one. The Cameron right on. Long had really bad internet connected issues, even at Sun, where the internet is the you know the network is the company, and so I long arranged for my workflow, my daily every time workflow, to never touch the internet. It just does not. If I want to touch the internet during my workflow, I'll have a different command I'll use that will say don't build, but build and check Maven for updates to blah blah blah, and get your libs and install yada yada. And I do that when the internet's good and stable. But if I'm flying on a plane and I'm crossing the Atlantic, the Wi-Fi is connected so I can get my email, but it's at one byte a second. And if it touches Maven on every build cycle, it takes, it'll take it 30 seconds to a minute to decide that nothing happened to go talk to Maven over the plane, airport, airplanes, Wi-Fi. It's like, no, stop that. Yeah. So, I'm totally convinced that new package managers that are invented for new languages today, fetch needs to be its entirely own command. Yeah, right. If and you, you touch the internet. network when they say fetch, and you do not touch the network when they don't say fetch. Yep, yep, yep. Thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, for Cliff, um, namely, like from the perspective of an uh, optimizing compiler writer, like how big of an impact uh, do pure functions make? Like, let's say you have an imperative language, and yep. you make, let's say, so. So one thing I like. Uh, to do, or I'm thinking of is, for instance, making functions const expert by default, like their compile time function evaluatable, uh, like their their functions are function can... with no side effects. No, no, I, I mean, no. like uh, like one example, uh, what I think is is pretty interesting is making functions uh, be able to be computed at compile time by default, and then if you need something that cannot can only be done at runtime, you, you add an, like an uh, additional flag. Uh, that, yeah, but so you can do the same thing for pure uh, pure like um, functions. Okay. And I was wondering, like, is that like how big of a win is that uh, having pure functions by default for an imperative language? Yeah, right. So. Um... I have never worked in a language where the type system actually enforced pure. There were many languages which claimed they had a pure type system, keyword, pure, const, whatever. 
None of them actually enforced it, including Java, where the final keyword is overwritten by reflection. So in all of these cases, you can't rely on it being pure. So the answer is no effect. If I looked at things where I could deduce purity myself, it's almost always a tiny function. Those just become inline, obvious inline candidates. So you don't need a special property. Once they're inline, the compiler will deduce purely straight up, purity straight up, right? He'll just watch your side effects for you and won't care. So I'd say in the current spec of the world, none. I don't have any experience with a language that has a large number of pure functions that you wouldn't just obviously inline straight up anyhow. Yeah, that's also what I'm thinking because like a lot of times the candidates that are like like some some functions that uh like you want to really remove are like these lazy iterator chains in Rust, but like they're all small, and they all get inlined. Uh, like all of these standard library functions, especially around collections and iterators, yeah, they're so small. So then, yeah, uh, so that's why I was wondering, like, yeah, but you're better off, you're better off getting your register allocator to where the cost of inlining a function when you're already out of registers is no worse than the standard caller, callee, save, prologue, epilogue spills are gonna do anyhow. When you hit that point, you can inline freely up to iCache limits. And this removes a huge amount of the grief about performance of functions being small or large or whatever. And that was in one of the major pushes I did at Hotspot at Sun and that turned into a lot of performance on the end. Um, the register allocator will, in general, be no worse, generally better, but generally no worse than not inlining. And that meant the cost to inline was only if you were risking iCache blowout. And so... so I was a not. little confused about uh, when you said that uh, you spill enough that you can always inline or you can mostly inline or... You, you I, don't I spill. Exactly you said. Yeah. Okay, so, so the standard here for... Uh, the industry compilers I worked on for many years before, I worked on quite a few, was always, you know, one good spill deserves another. And what it really means is that the allocator was fine when he had enough registers and didn't need to spill. And you get a couple spills and he's kind of okay. And if you kept inlining, he'd fall over some threshold that he'd never recover from. And he would spill a register and need it right away. And the loading that register would spill something else that he needed right away. And the Jay-Z chain basically shoved all things that you would in register now into the stack, more or less. And he was endlessly spilling. The code would turn into like 30% spill code, like an insane amount of spill code. And this was common across many compilers. So the inline heuristics would all have this scared of the knee of the curve where the allocator would suddenly fall over the knee in the curve and produce really shit code. So they would carefully tune the, the inliner to not inline where he might risk falling over the code and he'd lose a ton of inlining opportunities. Certainly in the land of Java where everyone was writing accessors and wrappers around every kind of thing on the planet, if you failed to inline some stupid ass thing, it was actually more code because the function call was greater than the fucking load that was already going to common sub expression anyway. Anyhow, if you you know inline to get her, so the 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 risk was you inlined and you failed. The risk was you didn't inline. When you didn't inline, you went through the calling convention prolog epilog code, which did a whole lot of loads and stores. If you did inline, the risk was you spilled too much with a whole lot of loads and stores. If you got those two to kind of balance, that the allocator didn't fall over some knee in a curve and then head into land where it spilled all the time, then the cost of inlining was no more. Now, it might be less. It might commonly be less, especially if these tiny functions had all their parts already pre-computed earlier and you come and sub-expression them away and all the null checks that had to be done on the unknown things that came in had already been loaded and null checks. So they all went away too. And suddenly the cost to inline was a negative number. You know, you got gains for inlining. That is the common thing you'd expect. So you just want to inline and you keep inline, inline, inline until you blow out your iCache. You have to back off at some point, but you'd like to have the ability to inline based on something other than the register allocator. So if you're looking to go do performance on these things, you're gonna you're gonna want to spend some time on the register allocator, and that that was my go-to big heavy answer at Sun for many years. When I did all the easy optimizations and all the normal ones, I mean, common common sub expression, range signal, and it's all done. 
and I'm staring at miles and miles and mountains and mountains of junky Java code, then I'd, I'd stare at something and realize this should have inlined and that should not have spilled. And I go back to the allocator and I'd spend two, three months on the allocator. Suddenly we could yeah, I really and 5% performance gain across the board. On every Java program on the planet, it would take an average 5% gain, but it started from the register allocator. So if someone was writing something like that, would you recommend they go back and read the graph coloring literature? Or would you recommend they read C2's code? No, graph coloring the literature. I, I can I can talk to you about, there, there is a, a cheap, efficient, good way to build the core structures you have to build that C2 started with and somebody hacked out and it made it like, much harder to read. But the, the, the key gains turn into where do you spill? So all of the graph coloring and all of the linear scan guys all say, here's what you get that's really cool when you didn't spill. That's not the problem. The problem is what do you do when you spill? And the C2 code is really kind of messy and there was never a rewrite done on it. So I don't recommend reading it unless you're kind of hardcore into it. Um, I can tell you the high level concepts and if you re-implement it, surely you will implement something better. But there is a high level concept of how to keep track of counter registers and where to spill and why you spill that you can keep the spill cost under control. Is and it mostly is, heuristics? Yeah, it's heuristics. But that's people write code in a way the same way when writing code for 40 years. There have been some changes, but uh, and many of them say, I got to inline more. But by and large, after a little bit of inlining, it looks like the same crappy code we wrote in the 70s and 80s. Okay, so, I'm not sure if you can answer this question, but um, you remember the other week how I showed uh, my SSA like code? Uh, would that affect uh, heuristics much? In the right allocator? Nah. It's going to be SSA like by the time you get to the extra allocator, no matter what. Okay, so even though my code is SSA like, that's not going to affect uh, how they because anyone's how, junky the, code the heuristics. Right. right, because anyone's junky code that's not SSA like will look like SSA by the time it gets to the extra allocator. Okay, okay. That's not that's not where the heuristics look interesting. It's how many simultaneously live things do you have, and what is the cost of a spill? And then, you know, where do you spill when you want to keep more things alive? But not quite yet, but in a little while, they got to come around and and then, you know, you, you end up spilling poorly because you just yeah, ran but out. People mutate um, variables uh, often. And if you just have one store that you have to deal with versus uh, like six stores. Uh, no. No? By the time no. you're in, certainly in the okay, land of Java C2, alias analysis was sharp enough that all of them stores turns into turns into a register bump. They're not, not an update to memory. They're a register got modified. That's much faster than the update to memory. Now, if you're writing to into a data structure, well, that'll still be there. And those stores exist. But if you're just saying, I have four I equals zero, I less than N, I plus plus, that I plus plus is always in a register. But if you have all these other global variables that are floating around and they're all aliasing sharply because they're globals on the, I know the namespace and you don't take their address, they turn into registers too. You can take their address now. Yeah, now now you got loads and stores and get issues. Don't take their address. Who's that? You're just quoting a guy. You know, if you don't take the address of a little variable. It's no more than just a local. It is. That's that's fine. All right, it's noon. Somebody got me in a rant on register allocators and inlining. Um. Anyone else want to say something? Yes, people have to go. I think we're, we're winding down. All right, we're going to declare victory. Until we meet again. That's fun. All right, see y'all. Bye. Cameron, next Bye. week, I'd be interested in talking about the LAMP stack and how ecstasy compares to what? That was PHP. You said one of the real values of ecstasy was your application lives on disk. But when it was PHP, I had a file that was on disk and a bunch of things that were in the database. And when I got hit, I read the file, compiled it, accessed the database, put the data together, gave you the page. Like, no, that's a that's a perfectly reasonable point. Actually, I, I was, mean, I, I I know this is it, funny because we were talking about PHP this morning on the on, on the chat, and then this, I had the same thought that you were just saying because. At, 
years ago, if you wanted an ultra dense hosting, you would use Perl or PHP as the back end because at Georgia Tech, we had a server named Acme and it mm -hmm. had 11,000 students' web pages on it. And it was I fine in, because the vast majority of them ago. got zero queries per second. I, I, I happen to know something about that server. <laughs> It's a long, about a the long... Georgia Tech Acme server? Yep. All right, next week. Next week. I'm not, okay. not going to well, talk about it while we're recording, but sometime when you and I are having a, a bottle or two of wine, I'll, I'll I'll tell you some stories about Georgia Tech. Hey, Aaron, okay, aren't you next in the week, Bay Area? PHP, and then in person, we'll do the Acme server. Aren't Very you in good. the Bay Area? Huh? Are you in the Bay I'm Area? I'm in Redwood City. Well, fuck. Why don't we have a beer? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah, are yeah. you on the Discord yeah. at all? Yes, you are. Let's have yeah, a beer. I'm on the Discord, but not have a discussion but about he, beer right but now. Has, but, but he has kids, so you're gonna have to. You're gonna have to. Oh, you bring your wife and with. kids. <laughs> Sounds bring good. Bring my wife. Maybe I can bring my kids. They'll play with your kids. It'll be easy. How old are I your kids? Twenty-two, twenty-five, twenty-seven, thirty, something like that. They'll play with your okay. kids. Yeah. I, I'm also nearby, so uh, if yeah, you pile in. Do it somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about this on Discord, not on live recording. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye.